Coming up on DTNS, Pac-Man is 30 and has been reinvented from scratch by an AI. Why the cops don't have the right to look at your lock screen without a warrant. And you've been pronouncing that one tech term wrong, but we'll tell you the right way. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, May 22nd, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Studio Denver, I'm Shannon Morse. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Len Peralta. Show's producer, I am, and I'm the show's producer, Roger Chan. Uh, we were just having a, a wonderful uh, discussion of cemeteries and being mistaken for the wrong nationality on Good Day Internet. Become a member. Get the stories. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. NVIDIA reported earnings of $1.80 per share and revenue of $3.08 billion on Thursday, which beat expectations. Working from home, learning at home, and gaming drove demand, according to a letter from NVIDIA's CFO. Gaming rose 25%, and chips for data centers rose 80%, passing $1 billion for the first time. IBM is not providing details related to location, departments, or number of employees involved in its impeding layoffs, which it is confirming. Bloomberg is reporting that today's number is actually in the thousands. The latest beta app of WhatsApp lets you add contacts by scanning a QR code. So you don't have to go in there and create a new contact in your address book. Of course, it only works if you're near someone, really. But a QR code can be revoked if it gets shared with someone you don't want. Uh, no word on when this feature would come out of beta. Uh, the story broke after our show yesterday, but Business Insider and The Information are both reporting that Magic Leap has received $350 million a month after cutting 1,000 jobs and dropping plans for a consumer business. We talked about that on the show in the past. Magic Leap has now withdrawn its layoff notice, reportedly, meaning that those job losses might not happen after all. In a note to staff, CEO Tony Ab Ab Abovitz said, quote, we're making very good progress in our healthcare, enterprise, and defense deals. 30 years ago, on May 22, 1990, Microsoft Solitaire arrived on Windows 3.0 under the name Windows Solitaire. It was hoped it would help people learn how to drag and drop items on their computer screens with the mouse, because not everybody knew how to use a mouse. Microsoft says 35 million people still play Solitaire every month. Oh, that's so cute. Facebook announced its workplace communication platform now has 5 million paid users, up 2 million as of the end of March. The company also announced that Messenger Rooms is available on Workplace, letting users quickly start up group video calls, as well as support for inviting non-workplace or Facebook users to join by URL. Facebook also added work groups, which lets workplace users create smaller chat groups outside of their larger social circle. The company also added live producer mode, letting video call hosts start polls, share their screens, and run Q&As, and video calls now support automatic captions in English, Spanish, Portuguese, French, Italian, and German. In a little more Facebook news, what do we got there, Sarah? Oh, it's a new trend, everyone. Facebook announced Thursday it will make most of its U.S. jobs open for remote hires and let existing employees request permanent work-from-home status. This is significant because Facebook employs a lot of people. It also follows Twitter, Coinbase, Shopify, and other companies implementing similar policies. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg said U.S. staff approved to work remotely will have until January 1st. 2021 to update the company on where they will be based. Also an interesting detail since it might mean it is going to affect what they will be paid. Salaries will be adjusted based on the typical pay for their position in that region. Facebook will hold campus on sites to build camaraderie uh, among remote and in-office workers. And it also means that Facebook will be making its employees use the new collaboration technologies that it itself develops. It's so perfect. The Wall Street Journal reports that LinkedIn recorded a 28% increase in remote job postings and a 42% increase in searches using the terms remote or work from home. So I think we have an official uh, trend, everyone. Yeah. Uh, you know, just the caveats here, not every single Facebook employee gets to work from home, even if their job would allow it. 
Uh, they, they, in an interview with The Verge, uh, Mark Zuckerberg talked a lot about the need for in-person training. Uh, they, they're going to learn as they go. They're going to start by approving, you know, people who've worked there for a long time have good performance records to work from home, uh, and they'll take what they learn from that and may approve more people all the time. But that said, Sarah, you're right. Like this, Twitter, Shopify, Coinbase, others uh, are me leaning into this in a way we were wondering a couple of months ago. You're like, hey, after people have worked from home for a couple of months, will it stick? Well, with these companies, it sounds like it is. I think in a lot of ways, like this is definitely a trend for the year and they're going to be, they're realizing that they're going to be saving a lot of money by not having to rent like big office spaces in the middle of these really big cities right next to, for example, a train station where, you know, these companies would usually look for these places so that their employees could easily get there. But on the other hand, since they're moving to more work from home for people, they're definitely going to have to maybe transition that money that they're saving in renting spaces or purchasing land into security for their work from home users and making mm -hmm. sure that everybody has, you know, compatible internet and has the ability to be able to work from home in a technological sense. And the training, right? To train them to be secure from home when they're when they don't have all the safeguards around. That's a that's a really, really good point. And of course, you know, Shannon, uh, when you move somewhere uh, that's not the Bay Area, it gets cheaper. And we were wondering uh, previously whether they would cash in on that. And if we talked about this with Justin Robert Young on Good Day Internet yesterday, uh, it'll be interesting to see how employees react to that if they say, well, you know what, I still just want to live somewhere cheaper, even if I have to take less money. Will they fight back against that? That'll be interesting to watch. Yeah. You know, also, Facebook is just one of uh, a few examples. Google is another really big one in the Bay Area in particular, where you have this sort of culture of people who want to live in a cool city, but then have to take this huge shuttle bus mm. an hour each way every day, you know, in order to go to the campus but they're not living next to the campus because that doesn't really make sense for them. You know, I know somebody who works at Facebook who was like, if I never have to get back on that bus, it's like, it's just the best thing. It's not mm -hmm. even working from home necessarily. It's just reimagining what my job entailed in the past. And it was a little bit of a golden handcuff situation because it was a great job. District Judge John Kovenauer of the U.S. District Court in Seattle ruled that powering on a phone to view the lock screen by law enforcement requires a search warrant. Before you scoff, listen through the legal reasoning here. The ruling came in a case involving a May 2019 arrest in Washington state where a police officer pressed the power button to bring up the phone's lock screen during the course of the arrest. And then a second instance later in February 2020, when the FBI turned on the phone intentionally to take a picture of the lock screen, which displayed the name Streezy on it. So that was evidence that they could use in building their case. The judge ruled that each instance was a separate issue. He said, yes, police may conduct searches without a warrant under special circumstances like taking inventory of personal effects. So the judge ordered, let's clarify whether this police search fell within those bounds. Maybe it did. Like he's sending it back to say, you need, you didn't give me the evidence to tell one way or another. So, you know, figure that out. We can guess it probably did. But he also ruled the FBI physically intruded on a constitutionally protected area when they went later and grabbed the phone and powered it up without a warrant. And that because accessing the phone at all was the intrusion, it was unnecessary to consider an expectation of privacy on a lock screen as a result. The FBI had argued like, hey, nobody has an expectation of privacy to your lock screen. And the judge said, that may be, but we don't even need to go there because you shouldn't have been able to do this without a warrant. You shouldn't have been able to go to the phone in the first place to power it up without a warrant. You needed the warrant to do that uh, in the first place. It wasn't like he was holding it in his hand and you saw it, uh, which would be a whole separate issue. So I, I don't know. I, I feel like on the face of this, it sounds like it's ridiculous to say, like, what? It's illegal to look at our lock screen? Come on. Like, our law enforcement uh, officials need to have that power. But that's not exactly what the judge is saying. 
Yeah, this is so fascinating to me. I love this court ruling in in the sense that, for example, I've reviewed five different phones in the past two months. And the differences that you see in between each one in how they set up security for a lock screen, some of them automatically enable notifications on the lock screen. And you have to go into the settings and turn that off. Some of them allow you to set like a if lost notification on your lock screen. And that could give government or law enforcement offer, uh, offers officers some kind of information that you may not necessarily want them to have. So there's a lot of stipulations around lock screens that vary diversely depending on what device you're actually using from what manufacturer. So hearing that they've actually detailed, okay, it's, it's fine if they're like putting this into uh, inventory or whatever, but if they're physically unlocking it and looking at it to find some kind of evidence that requires a warrant. And that's very, very important for a lot of these cases. Yeah. And, re and remember, it requires a warrant. Doesn't mean they can't do it. Also, this is different than self-incrimination, where they can make you uh, use your thumbprint to unlock it, but they can't make you give the passcode. That's a Fifth Amendment thing. This is a Fourth Amendment thing. Those are different situations. Yeah, I had to, I had to check myself a little bit this morning because my first reaction when I read this article from Ars Technica was like, "Wait, what? Like, who would put incriminating information on their lock screen? This makes no sense." And it was like, "No, Sarah, think about it. If you were." unfairly targeted as you know a, somebody who had done something wrong right and somebody looks at your lock screen doesn't matter what's on it it means it's wrong you can't do that without a warrant without you know justifiable cause to come into my life and 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 snoop through mm. stuff so in that sense it seems like the right call well, we have some more Snoopy news, uh, some more privacy news. This one is from North and South Dakota. So privacy software maker Jumbo analyzed the North and South Dakota contact tracing app called Care19 for iOS, finding that it sent location, a unique phone ID, and the app's unique citizen code to Foursquare in violation of Care19's privacy policy. So Foursquare uses the information to return a recognizable place name like a store or a restaurant. Proud Crowd, the developer of the Care19 app, says the data is not used for commercial purposes. The Android version of Care19, there's also an Android version, this one obscures the data sent to Foursquare. So a Foursquare, a Foursquare spokesperson said that the company promptly discards the data, and Proud Crowd said that it will stop sharing the unique citizen code and revise its privacy policy to disclose the relation with Foursquare. This is mostly uh, whoever wrote their privacy policy needs to be uh, reprimanded or possibly fired. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because Foursquare very uncontroversially uh, provides uh, location labeling. That they, They've done this for years. It's one of their greatest services. Almost any app you use where the dropdown says, hey, you're near the McDonald's, you know, is using the Foursquare database. So that's not controversial. What was controversial is they didn't disclose that in the privacy policy. They absolutely should, and they're fixing that. And the other thing was using the unique citizen code and the phone ID. I can maybe see an argument for needing one of those just to keep the request straight in the database as they all flood in. Uh, but there are ways to obfuscate that that they used in Android. I'm curious why they aren't able to do that in iOS. And you certainly didn't need both. Uh, so there was a little bit of over-engineering there. And I think just the fact that it's Foursquare that's involved with this story is kind of a fear factor. You see that social platform, kind of a social service, and this is going to really deter uh, of the potential mm -hmm. popularity of these contact tracing apps, which will help the health industry with tracing any kind of COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, outbreaks that happen in a community. So this this is definitely a negative for contact tracing uh, techno technology in itself, but I hope that them changing the privacy policy and getting this news out there early will help with the engagement. Yeah, sadly, you're right. Like the bad PR may cause a lot of people to not use this. That would have otherwise. And you need people to use these things for them to be effective. Well, a uh, particularly positive point, especially if you like things that are downloaded oh, yeah. quickly, researchers at Australia's Monash, Swinburne, and RMIT published an article in Nature Communications describing a new internet speed record of... 44.2 terabits per second. Now, if you're like, I don't know, that sounds fast, but how fast is it? You could download more than 50, 100 gigabyte 4K movies in a second. 
with those speeds. The researchers <laughs> placed a micro comb within the cable's fibers to make data transfer more efficient, also more compact. Otherwise, the setup used standard optical fiber and a single integrated chip source, meaning that it's possible it could be implemented on existing fiber infrastructures. And don't ask me why you need it. You do. <laughs> <laughs> Cloud service providers, like cloud backups and stuff, that could be so oh gosh, so yeah. useful. Uh, and this, you know, this is in the, in the uh, the research lab. It's it's not out in the field yet. Uh, it was in the field in, for their paper and the purposes of that, but it's not something you can go buy. It's going to be a while before that, and it'll probably be used for what you're saying at the beginning, Shannon. Some some backhaul, uh, but just I don't know. Blistering blistering speeds like this it, are always. Fascinating it's also to look you know. At. There was a time where, you know, the idea of a terabyte, oh, yeah. you know, was just like, what? That's so much data. I, it's, it's crazy. Like, nobody can download that much stuff. But you did hear, you know, oh, so-and-so scientists at this research facility have proven it might be possible in this very limited test case. So, uh, you know, I look forward to our new 44.2 terabit <laughs> per second future. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, first of all, uh, happy 40th birthday, Pac-Man. 40 years ago, Puck-Man hit the arcades in Japan. They changed it to Pac-Man because Puck uh, was too close to Tuck or something like it. Uh, generative Adversarial Networks, or GANs, are a type of AI system that trains by playing, it off, playing off itself. Now, why am I telling you this? Hold on. You'll find out in a moment. Uh, to oversimplify how GANs work, one network will generate attempts to do the thing, like make a cat picture, that's called the generator, and the other will decide if it's a picture of a cat or not. That's called the discriminator. The adversarial nature mean these networks play off each other and get better faster. NVIDIA has posted about its game GAN, which they have trained to make a video game engine from scratch and bring it all back for its first trick, Game Gan was trained on 50,000 hours of Pac-Man gameplay. They did a thing that has been done a lot, trained an AI to play Pac-Man, but they didn't stop there. We've trained a lot of AIs to play games. They also trained an AI to create Pac-Man just by watching the gameplay. Uh, so it would see the gameplay and go, okay, let me put together uh, a game engine that can do what that thing is doing. Pac-Man speed, movement abilities, inability to go through walls, ghost movement patterns, uh, power pellets, uh, ghosts touching the Pac-Man, supercharged or otherwise. It was able to replicate all of that just by watching. Three neural networks ran memory, a dynamics engine, and a rendering engine to make the code. And the upshot is they created a GAN that can learn the rules of a game by observing it. That could be useful in creating new content, like new levels in Pac-Man could be created by this GAN. And theoretically, other games could benefit from that in game design, where you wouldn't have to have the designers make all the levels. You could have the, the GAN make them. Now, they don't quite hit the maximum standard here. The gameplay maxes out at 128 by 128 pixel resolution and 50 frames per second. Uh, so it's got a way to go before it can be used in your favorite 3D shooter. And NVIDIA says it will make a playable version of GameGAN's Pac-Man available this summer on NVIDIA's AI Playground, so you'll get a chance to see how well they did. But this isn't also just about games. The paper published on GitHub sets the problem as creating a simulation by watching an agent interact with an environment. And of course, in this case, the simulation was Pac-Man and the agent interacting with the environment was Pac-Man playing the game. But it could also be watching recorded videos, say from drivers, in order to train an autonomous car. Again, something that can be really useful right now during lockdown when those autonomous cars can't go out into the real world. Yeah, that is such a good comparison. You know, you think like, oh, it's Pac-Man. Okay, it's a grid. You know, you're moving around trying to get away from things and, you know, trying to, you know, cut, cut all the right corners. That is a lot like driving. So if you think of that on a larger scale, especially in a town like Phoenix, for example, where it's relatively flat and relatively, you know, 90 degree corners kind of thing, then it gets really interesting. I love it. I think it's so fascinating that they're able to do this. And and you're right, like having that comparison to autonomous vehicles would help that entire industry like twofold. I can see how that could be super, super useful in the future. And I do want to mention for the gamers out there, if you are interested, uh, they do plan on releasing this in the summertime sometime, but nobody knows if it's going to be like on NVIDIA's, uh, their, their streaming service or if it'll be a downloadable thing. So I guess we'll see. 
<laughs> well, they said on NVIDIA's AI playground, but yeah, mm -hmm. I don't I don't know exactly uh, what that will entail either. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Ars Technica Samuel Axon, in my opinion, has done <laughs> the Lord's work. <laughs> Samuel Axon tracked down what the accepted pronunciation of dozens of tech words are. Now, this isn't the GIF controversy. He didn't, he, he went well beyond that. He's like, everyone's battling that one out. Uh, I'm going to mention some of the pronunciations he dealt with in his article. We'll have a link in the show notes and you should absolutely read the whole thing. But I want you all to state your preferred pronunciation and then we'll talk about what Axon discovered in his research. And he he went through like 500 message boards. It was trying to find like legitimate sources. What do people do in the most part? Do they usually say it this way? Do they usually say it that way? What does the founder say? What does the company say? So we start off with one I didn't realize was even a controversy. iOS or iOS? I have never heard of iOS. Same. Yeah, I, never. I just, it's, it's never, I've never once heard it, but. Apparently, 30%, you know. <laughs> I think, of the people he talked to say iOS. Okay, maybe that's overestimating. I don't see the 30% number in his article, but there are people who say iOS out there, uh, but Apple, Final word on this one is iOS. Okay, that that that's our warm up. How about sudo or sudo? This is the command line thing that says, "Hey, I want to use my make administrator password." Yes, yeah, sudo make me a sandwich, or is it sudo make me a sandwich? Oh man, I've always said sudo, but I, I don't know. I, so, I mean, Shannon, what do you think? So technically, it stands for super user do. So it should be sudo, but everyone, and I say this as somebody who has made like over a hundred videos about the Linux command line, everyone says sudo. I don't know anybody that says sudo. And well, that's you, just accepted. You have not met the 22.4% of forum user respondents on linux.org who responded <laughs> to Axon's survey saying it should be pronounced sudo. I want to believe that those people actually don't say sudo in real life. Or just, it, they, they just, you know. they know what's correct. Uh, but the co-inventor, Robert Cogshall, says it's meant for super user do. You should say sudo. So in this case, Axon ruled sudo. Sudo is the proper pronunciation. We've just all been saying it wrong. Yep. All right. Wireless <laughs> power. Uh, QI should be, should it be chi? key or qi you know this is this is one that i well I, I was about to say i know it should be chi because i know that tom will correct me when i say it wrong <laughs> sometimes in our pre you know pre-show meetings but, but was i right to do that I well don't... i don't know well it, but it's one of the ones where i have to think every single time like how do i say this how do i say this correctly <laughs> i want to make sure i get it correctly um and i i feel I don't know. At least other people have a hard time with this one. I say chi, but I used to say I used to mispronounce it every single time I would say it. The only reason it changed is because I think it was like a PR rep at Anchor's booth at CES or something said, "Oh, it's chi," and I was like, "What?" And they told me about the Chinese background of the the right. actual symbol for it. So now I know. Yeah. And that it's part, like, what, with the background, you're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. It would it be helped me remember it. Yeah. Blame Romanized pinion for the confusion here, because why we right. we spell chi with a Q, I, I don't quite understand. But the Wireless Power Consortium does say, and they manage the standard, that it should be pronounced chi because, yes, it is based on the Chinese character. All right. <laughs> SQL and MySQL or SQL and MySQL or some combination. Is it SQL and MySQL or SQL and MySQL? It's squirrel. No, <laughs> no it's definitely it's not squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I do remember, I don't know, I, I feel like I'm on the wrong side of a lot of these, you know, in the past, someone saying SQL, SQL server, but then I said MySQL, and, you know, I kind of trying to explain something. They were like, no, you don't say it that way. You say my SQL. Well, I'm like, but it's SQL already. Well, but that's different. And Sarah, I remember SQL, it was SQL. one of the first times where I was like, oh, all right, well, <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to do it right. It, 
sequel makes more sense to me. It just kind of flows off the tongue better, but that's again My how sequel things... to sequel. Squirrel. Uh, I have always said SQL and my sequel because it's more words with my sequel and it felt uh, easier, but I'm wrong. My SQL's technical doc says it should be my SQL. There is no consensus on just SQL though. Uh, and Axon finally ruled this one is a beautiful mess and you can generally go where your heart <laughs> takes you and feel okay about it as long as you don't call it squirrel. Okay. Well, Shannon, I don't know. Uh, all right, I one last one. To troll people. <laughs> <laughs> one last one. Uh, slash L I B and slash B I N. Are they lib and bine? Because <gasps> library and binary is what they stand for, or is it lib and bin? Oh man, you know, knowing what they stand for, of course, you're like, it makes sense to call it li lib and bine. I would never say that. It's no. lib and bin. Every single time I've worked in the CLI, I've always say, said lib and bin. That's just the way we say it. And he found a lot of people, uh, interestingly for the internet, willing to entertain lib and bind because of the because they probably made this argument for GIF in the past <laughs> of like, huh? But I made that argument that it's graphical, and so maybe I should be saying lib and bind. Uh, but uh, most people do say lib and bin. Uh, so Axon wrote either lib or lib is fine. So therefore either bin or bind is fine, but technically no one ever says bind. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> like he found examples of people saying lib for, for that, but he ne he's like, I don't think I found any, like maybe more than one or two people who said bind for, for the uh, bin. Cause I always think it's a bin full of things. I forget that it does stand for binaries. Totally. Like, yeah. 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 Um, this wasn't really a, a one of the things on the list, but I will say for the record that I still encounter people on a pretty regular basis who say Mimi instead of meme. Oh I'll my gosh. Leave, I'll just leave it at that. Mm, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Are they uh, wrong? Yeah. I don't know. At this point, Maybe Roku, right. Mac OS X, Linux, they're all there in the Ars Technica article. We'll have the link in the show notes. Hey, everybody, you can join in the conversation in our Discord, which you can link to by uh, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. You can talk about memes and all sorts of other things. Yeah, all the memes on Roku are there. Uh, <laughs> let's check out the mailbag. This one isn't a GIF, uh, but it is from <laughs> Mink, who says, here's what I think. Shutter. Here's what I think is the reason for Netflix defaulting to close inactive user accounts. We talked about this with Justin Robert Young on the show yesterday. Mick says, as you said, Netflix has seen genuine competition in streaming. So what this will let them do is change the conversation around who their users are. They keep almost 100% of their users, but they can now say 100% of our users are active users, and that shows a stronger brand. I don't know how they monetize that information, though, but I know that there's no shortage of ways to do that. So in the eyes of somebody looking to buy user information to advertise to, Netflix would now be a much stronger brand. They don't do that, though, and they've been very clear that they don't want to do that. They don't have any plans to do that. Um, so maybe it's just useful internally. Like it, you, Mink's argument still holds, uh, even if they're not selling it outside. Maybe it's just good for convincing producers and stuff. Uh, another thought from Kimberly, the Texas teacher on this topic. At one point last year, there was talk in Congress of maybe even a bill to require all subscription type services to confirm customers wanted to continue using it once a year. This wouldn't just be internet stuff like Netflix or Imperfect Fruit, but also things like gym memberships. Maybe this was in the pipeline by Netflix as a response to that proposed legislation. They, maybe they were just getting ahead of it. Hey, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Scott Hepburn, Dan Kolbeck, and Erwin Stur. Let's check in with Len Peralta. Uh, did you draw an abstract of Bine or something else today? I think she was drawing memes. I don't know about you guys, but uh, uh, no, you know, I actually uh, found this very interesting uh, today. Obviously, being uh, 40th birthday for Pac-Man, I wanted to make sure I celebrated that correctly. And what better way, really, 
to celebrate Pac-Man's 40th birthday by then giving him a weird clone, right? <laughs> Some of the weird... AI-derived uh, monstrosity. Look yeah, weird-looking weirdo clone, and that's what this is. It's called This image is called Pac-Clone, and uh, this is uh, you know Pac-Man and his birthday party getting a weird clone. Um, I'm probably going to have to add this... You know, this little creature is saying all these weird, like, lib, lib and bind and me and stuff <laughs> here. I think uh, that would be a nice little addition on this. Um, Excellent. But, yeah, this is available right now. If you want to go to my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len, or at my online store at lenperaltastore.com. I love how the, the ghosts are like, are you okay, weird clone? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're, going on we're, we're slightly we're concerned. concerned. <laughs> I've made my AI. I can't help it. Uh, also, thanks to Shannon Morse for being with us today. Shannon, always a pleasure. And let folks know where they can keep up with the rest of your work. Thank you for having me. Yeah, over at youtube.com slash Shannon Morse. I just reviewed the TCL phones. It's their first time making phones for the U.S. market. So I was very intrigued to check out these two little Android phones. So you can watch those videos over on my YouTube channel. Also, I wanted to remind everybody, please do follow Daily Tech News Show over on Twitter and Instagram too. Uh, Instagram.com slash DTNSPicks and Twitter.com slash Daily Tech News SH as in show, and you can see all of the happenings over there. Yeah, uh, Shannon, you've been doing a wonderful job uh, putting stuff up on there. Thank you for for mm -hmm. doing all of that. Uh, if you want to keep that coming, one of the reasons we're able to, to do a lot of the stuff that we do is because you support us directly. Uh, there are ways to do that. Uh, if you've got some extra cash, if you're gainfully employed and, and you want to support the show directly and get rid of the ads, go to dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. Uh, and if you just want to do something that's free, whether you're supporting us on Patreon or not, uh, we've been getting wonderful reviews in the Apple Podcast Store. And we thank everybody for doing that. It makes our day every time we see one of those come through. Uh, so even if you're not really an Apple Podcast user, it, it's helpful getting the word out. Uh, go leave, even if you just leave some stars, that helps uh, in podcasts app for iTunes. Thank you for that. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. And boy, do we love to hear what you have to say. So keep it coming. We're also live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. No show on Monday. It's Memorial Day holiday here in the U.S. But we'll see you Tuesday with Patrick Beja. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>